I'm excited particularly about this verse in our study of Psalm 23. I hope uh, that you have enjoyed going through it one verse at a time. Um, I don't do that very often and, and just am so grateful that, I've, that I really uh, felt like that's what God wanted me to do. Uh, next week we finish out the 23rd, so you don't want to miss it. It's, it's probably the, the, the pinnacle part um, because it doesn't just deal with the here and now, it deals with the soon to come. Uh, and, and so we're going to get excited about the soon to come. Uh, as well as as be encouraged, and so I, I'm, man, I'm just stoked. I'm stoked. I like that word. I love that word, stoked. So I'm going to use it. Uh, but every year, Stacy and I have done this, and and thank you, uh, all of you who come to it. Uh, but every year, Stacy and I play host at Christmas time for the church. And some of the things are the same, but other things change as we get older or y'all get more expensive. Uh, uh, just like my kids, the older they got, the more expensive they became. The, the, the longer we have done this with the pastor, it just the more expensive it gets. And, and it's a joy for us to do it, so don't think that we are complaining. We love to do it. I just wish that everything was as simple as seven-layer dip. I knew I'd get at least one amen out of that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, w the, the most important isn't whether we cook everything you want or don't want. Uh, whether it all looks like it jumped right off the pages of Food Network or it looks like we threw it in the oven and hoped it popped out looking edible. Uh, uh, you know, and I even put in parentheses, except for the seven-layer dip. Um, uh, you know, it, it is providing one thing that I think is key for for uh, for being successful in hosting. And, and according to several different articles as I was kind of studying this out and really just kind of watching the direction of this verse, uh, I started to read a bunch of different articles about how to be a successful host. And I don't do dinner parties. We do this once a year. Uh, but to get a little understanding and insight from these people who hold dinner parties, at least monthly, they hold these dinner parties, to read some things from them uh, and, and from other websites. One of the major things that was so valuable, I think, and it's what Stacy and I and all of the cleaning and all of the cooking and all of the rearranging, um, listen, I have built muscles that can move that couch and love seat pretty good. I'm, I'm proud of myself because we have to move those things in order to get all the chairs in so everybody has a place to sit. Uh, but with all of the rearranging and all of the things that we do, the one thing that we're trying to create in our home and, and the one thing I want you to, to get out of this entire uh, verse that we're going to look at is the ambiance of welcome. Ambiance is just another word for atmosphere. But it's the Welcome. The one thing that we want you to feel when you come to our house is welcome. Uh, never has there been a time where we have looked at the door and said, somebody shut the door and don't let them in. Uh, well, okay, Stacy, she just said, well, no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, it, it really is because uh, honestly, the more people there are in there, the more you eat, the less we have to. Because Christmas time is the time of year where New Year's resolutions uh, spring forth from the ground. Uh, but, uh, you know, but it's the, it's the atmosphere of welcome. And, and I want you to understand verse uh, 5 here 20, in Psalm 23, verse 5. And we're going to get to that in just a second. You need to take this, this idea. This is, this is what I want you to hear, that God has created an ambiance of welcome. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, you're welcome. You're welcome in the kingdom. Turn to your other neighbor and say, we're praying for you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it, the, it, in the kingdom, there's this ambiance of welcome. And, and, and God is the most awesome at creating welcome. Y'all are going to hear it, I, I, I hope. You'll, you'll get to that. And so just before we get into this... 
verse 5. Let's understand that David has now changed the perspective of the simple life. He maintains sheep and shepherd uh, uh, relationship, but he moves from this into a host and esteemed guest way of thinking. And again in verse uh, 6, he'll even change a little more. This changes the dynamic of the relationship that David has with God. We have seen that the relationship is most powerful when surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. David has shown us that as a shepherd, God is both a provider and a protector. And he sustains us with everything that we need as long as we drink from his endless supply. The relationship strengthens through intimate fellowship with him. The fellowship of closeness where he knows me by name. And his voice and face are all I seek. Leading me to a full restoration. And as we saw last week, lordship, fellowship intimate relationship, and everything that comes with it leads me through this life fearlessly overcoming fear. Because his presence, his protection, his position in my life as a prophet, a priest, and a king, and his tribe, which is you, ladies and gentlemen, the body of Christ, you are his tribe. All bring comfort for me which casts out fear. This is why some churches, you hear hear, hear them say, we just love to do life together. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Do life together. The reality of the church is, is that we should be doing life together. Because if strength is in numbers, then life becomes... ...in this... And this is our tribe and we are encouraging one another with the presence of God, with everything that he brings in. Then we see that all of this helps us walk through life overcoming the one thing that destroys us, fear. Fear is the destroyer. That's why we hear those songs, fear is a liar. Fear destroys. Praise God. So we now move on to God as a host in this relationship to see what else God has in his awesomeness to bring to the simple life. So Psalm 23 verse 5, this is what it says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Praise God. We love that verse. That's a good verse. And so as we look and journey through this verse, we've got to come to this uh, as God is a host. We understand that he is really good at preparing a table or, or I call it table prep. He's good at table prep. In, in fact, isn't it good that David doesn't say that we prepare a table for God? It says that God prepares the table before us. Preparing a table is a phrase used to imply a meal at God's table. David is saying that God has invited us to dine with him at his table and most notably, seat of honor. And so you need to understand that at the table of God, there's a place for you. You're welcome. We are glad when you come in. In fact, if you were to remember and remind yourself of the prodigal son, what is it that the father does when the lost son comes back home? He says, kill the fatted calf. He says, get the best robe. He says, get, the, get my signet ring. And he doesn't just say, get a ring. He says, get my signet ring. And puts it on his finger and he sits him in the best place. My honored guest, my son was dead. He's now alive. He's come home. He doesn't make him earn his welcome back. He comes back in. And so you need to understand that as you have developed in your relationship with God, remind yourself that the moment you said Jesus Christ is Lord, there was a seat at the table. And as everybody else's seat is honored, so is yours. There's no such thing as a low station seat. You are all sons and daughters. But notice who else is at the table. This psalm implies that not only has God invited you, but purposely brings the enemies. 
We don't think about that, do we? He has to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And if I'm seated at his table, because that's what he's saying, then he allows the enemy to see his table. Why? Because God's plan to vindicate and honor you isn't done in a corner. Jesus made several mentions that the Father rewards openly in front of all. Listen, if you truly believe that God has prepared a table of purposed blessing for you because of relationship with Him, then when the enemy, whether it's Satan himself or it, those around you who are detractors and distractions... Listen, those who have spoken evil against you, and, and it seems like, doesn't it, doesn't it seem like you knew people were talking about you, but the moment you gave your life to Jesus, it seems like those voices got louder. Every problem with you, all of a sudden, their voice, for whatever reason, matters more. When you were lost in the world, it's like, whatever, 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 I don't care what you say. But now that you're saved... Then the enemy comes in, he says, did you hear what they said? Did you hear what they think? Do you know what they're thinking about you? You're fixing to get fired. Didn't you know you're a bad employee? Or, or some other employee or a friend or, or an enemy, if you will. Someone has spoken something and it's like a seed that has just burred itself into that, into that first layer of skin that's irritating. You can't get to it and you have to let it fester to pull out. And God wants us to understand, David is saying, in the presence of my enemies, everyone who has spoken evil against me, everyone who has done something against me, everyone who has come against the call of God in my life, everyone who has come against the purpose in my life, everyone who has come against the giftings and the talents and the blessing and the presence, whatever it may have been, anyone, whether it's Satan himself or fleshly, God says, watch what I'm about to do because in your presence I'm fixing to bless them. That, that, that should have gotten at least one amen. So that you know, listen, the of those who are coming against you get louder, you should thank God. Because that means he's fixing to open the spread in front of them so that they see exactly how honored you truly are. Now, come on, somebody, you need to get a hold of that. God does not hold you to the opinion of someone else. He holds you to his own opinion. If he thinks highly of you as son, walk around as son only caring what God thinks about you. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks about you. And when their voices begin to get loud, just remember, you're seated in a place of honor at the Father's table. God is so good. Huh. He has a plan to silence the enemy without you ever having to do anything. Isn't it interesting that Jesus and Stephen, two great individuals, one greater than the other, obviously, two great individuals in Scripture, never responded or resorted to defending themselves in the presence of their accusers. In fact, think about what happened. Jesus never once defended himself. Never defended himself. Stephen never once defended himself against the accusations that were spoken against him. Lies that were said against him. Jesus faced lies in a courtroom that was not even, an, uh, was not even a legal time for him to be accused. It was all done wrong. He could have stood up and said, I am a citizen of Israel and this is done wrong. But he didn't. And look what happened. Look what the, the, uh, the provoking of God on their behalf took place in their life. What happens to Jesus? Yes, he dies, but he defeats death. Not only did he defeat death, but he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the way through which we are saved. His blood is the means by which we are reconciled to God. It did, God. Jesus didn't have to respond to those who were coming against him because he was already understood the blessing at the seat of the Father's table that was fixing to happen for him. That's why Paul could say that when he, when he came into the world, he didn't regard his position. In fact, he set his position aside to come into the world and then knowing the prize that was ahead, the bride that God was going to prepare through his death, he took it like a man and went all the way to the cross 
But then think about Stephen. Oh, if Stephen was the, uh, of the 120 in the upper room, and, and he, pro, or excuse me, he was probably a part of the 120 in the upper room. He definitely was on the outskirts. He was not a part of the 12. He's one of these guys that maybe he saw Jesus once or twice, got to touch him maybe once, but not really had a, a, a deep relationship with him like the 12. He gets stood up because the power of God is in his life and the enemy wants to take him out. And how's he going to do it? He's going to have people lie about him. So what what does Stephen do? What any good preacher would do? Pull out his best sermon. And he just preaches. He preaches Jesus. And isn't it funny as they are beating on him physically, railing on him, he looks up and God, just for him, opened up the heavenlies. And Stephen says, look. Now, you know he's pointing in the sky. Look, I see God. Wait a minute. No flesh can see God and live. But God opened up the heavens enough for Stephen to see him. I see God and Jesus standing at his right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the perks of being honored at the Father's table by far outweigh the words that anyone could ever speak against you. Because God is the supreme host. He's an amazing host. And there's nothing greater than that. Secondly, in this verse of Scripture, what does he say? He says, you, you prepare my table a table before me in the presence of my enemies. They're seeing I'm blessed. But then he does this. In the process of blessing you, isn't this good what he does? He says he anoints my head with oil. Anoints my head with oil. So God is good at anointing. Not only is, it, is he a good host at, at preparing a table, but he also is an anointing host. Now listen, during those days and on up through even Jesus' time on the earth in that region, the good host practice of anointing guests with oil was a welcome to the house of the host. In fact, when you walked in through the doors of the host's home, he would, he would anoint you. He would set you in a place where he, he would take oil and, and, so, and sometimes he would have some of perfume that was put in that oil and he would anoint your head with it because the arid country that they lived in, the the dust of travel, listen, they did not have the luxury of driving. They walked everywhere. They walked over rocks, rough terrain, wild animals to go anywhere. And so the heat that was there, it wasn't unbearable, but it definitely gets hot. And, and smelly, for sure. And it's, it's just a hot region. And the hot, if you know anything about heat, what's it do? It dries you out. Just this morning, I got up and I looked at myself and I went, I got dry patches. Why have I got dry patches on my face? I've not been outside. Not that long, at least. I got dry patches on my face. So Stacy goes, put on some lotion. Well, lotion does what? It brings healing to the skin. It's, it's going to take care of you. So it brings, it brings that healing coating to, to you. It also would cleanse the dust off of you. In, in other words, when, when the Father pours anointing on your head, he's not, he's, he's not typifying a call. He's removing where you've been. Oh, y'all didn't hear that part, did you? You, you? you didn't get that part. You see, because where you've been, is what he's washing off. The, 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 this was the practice. If, if you come into, if you were to, I don't know about you, but, well, okay, yeah, I'll use you. If you come to my house from now on, I'm going to have a big bucket of oil. And I'm going to pour it on your head. And rub it in. And you're going to walk in all greasy. Doesn't that sound like fun? Wow, she wants that. She said, okay, all right. No, but it was, it was to remove your past. See, okay, why is it that we in the church struggle with God removing our past? We sing songs that he has freed us from our past, but we're the ones that hold on to it. 
And God has said, I anoint your head with oil. Your head, the place of thinking, the place of thought. I anoint your head to remove the pain, the dryness, the soreness, and the memory of your past. I remove it from you so that when you come to the table, you're not coming in lowly. You come in refreshed. You come to the table refreshed. That this is it was a, a thing that they put in there to anoint themselves. In fact, when they were fasting, uh, there was an instruction because most people, for religious purposes, when they were fasting, would go in looking like they were somber and depressed. Because you all know, not eating food that's depressing. No, I'm kidding. But they would. He would say. Here's what you do. You put the oil of gladness. You anoint yourself. So where you've been, what you've been thinking, it's all gone. You're now refreshed when you come into the presence of the Lord. You come to sit at the table and you're not thinking about where you've been. You're thinking about who you're with. You're thinking about where you're going. And so he's, he puts this anointing on our heads to remove where we've been. Anointing wasn't just something that covered you to make you special. It didn't, and, and so it didn't just signify this kingly, this prophetic, this priestly calling upon a person's life. And, and I think too often we misunderstand anointing at times because we will say, th we will just throw that word anointing to call it supernatural and special. But anointing is, is listen, you're all anointed. Amen. By this definition, you're all anointed. Because your past has been removed. You're all anointed because there is healing that is taking place on you physically. You're all anointed because the Spirit of God brings refreshing to you as you come to the table of the Father. So it's, we, we've garnered this, this comment that, man, he is so anointed as if no one else can be. And so we create levels in the church and David goes, dispel with that, you're all sons and daughters, you're all anointed. Now what you do with that anointing matters. But you're all anointed. And then there's this anointing of healing. Oil applied to a person because of healing. The powerful thing is that uh, uh, this describes that, that they're dealing with where a person has been. God takes care of your past. Not only this, but though we have switched to hospitality, we cannot forget that David is still also thinking as a sheep and a shepherd. An anointing with oil for sheep was more than just a healing for an open wound on a sheep or removing dust. In bringing healing. In fact, uh, as I was studying for this, another reason, and this may make some of you kind of get all crawly, but uh, uh, one of the other reasons for anointing the head of a sheep and rubbing the oil into the sheep, especially with uh, some, some, they call it essential oils, it could be just herbs, whatever it was, that, but was because uh, sheep have a tendency to nostril bugs. Bugs that fly around their heads and faces, get on their nose and crawl up in their nose. I know, it's about to get sick, and I, I know some of you are already crawling. Not spiders, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking, I don't know what kind of bug it is. All I know is they go up there because of the warmth, uh, the, the warmth on the inner places in there. That's where they lay their eggs. And so, so, so when you, uh, a sheep would, would get irritated, not just trying to flap the bugs away, but as they were going up their nose, they're shaking, they're trying to get rid of the bugs out of their nose. And so a sheep would, uh, a shepherd would see that and he would begin to pour oil because it would try to get rid of them out of there. Because once they lay their eggs, that's it. And when they hatch, they create worms. And those worms crawl up into the brain of the sheep. No, no, hear it. How many times have we let the enemy plant eggs that have hatched to burrow into our minds to keep us down, to keep speaking to us about things that God's already covered? Uh, the, the, the Bible tells me that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Do you know God sits on his throne and never accuses you of wrongdoing? It's the enemy that comes in and says, did you see that? Did you see that? And then he goes to you and says, I saw you. I know you. I know everything you've done. You aren't real. 
You're not saved. You're, you're, you're terrible. You're a bad wife. You're a bad husband. You're a bad father. You're a bad mother. You're a bad employee. You're a bad student. You're a bad everything. You're just a bad person. And uh, that's true. And nobody likes you. And all those people that, that say that they love you, they don't really love you. They just feel sorry for you. Don't lie like you've never heard those things in your mind before. Don't lie like you've never thought to yourself, well, I wonder if they're really seeing me or if they're just trying to make me feel welcome. They can't stand me. Oh, I know they can't stand my kids. Come on now. I'm just being real. How many times have we done that? How many times have we thought to ourselves that somebody says something in correction and it all of a sudden translates into they can't stand me? Or, or, or they, say, they say something that, that it burrows deep into our, into our psyche and into our minds and it brings destruction to us. This is, what he, this is why he anoints your head. Because ladies and gentlemen, the battlefield of the mind, yeah. it's real. Yeah. It's a serious place. It's not a place to joke about. And, and, and I get it, you know, that, the, the, listen, we live in a country where it feels like, like mental deterioration is on the rise. People's minds, their, psychiat their, their psychological well-being, it's just being destroyed. And, and this isn't just uh, uh, people out in the world. These are hope-filled people in the church. Listen, when, when the prescriptions of people in the church having to take things for their mental is, is equal or equitable to what has been in the world, we've got a problem. And I don't mean to take away from, from anyone who is dealing with it, ladies and gentlemen. No, not at all. But you need to understand that if you have a seat at the table... If you've come into the presence of God Almighty as a son or a daughter, He stands there with an anointing to pour over your head to remove the things that have burrowed in there that keep you locked up and in prison right here. Yes. Amen. You don't have to be in prison to be in prison. And there are Christians all over the United States. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the United States. There are Christians all over Mount Pleasant right now who walk around in prison because they get to the door and they don't, they don't remind, they're not reminded that they have been anointed with oil. That there is a renewing that has taken place and is taking place in their mind. Listen, if there's a new way to be human, as the song goes from the, what, the late, oh, maybe it was 2000, I don't know when it come out, a song called New Way to Be Human. Um, I forget who even did it. Switchfoot, New Way to Be Human. They, re, they sing this song called, uh, obviously I've said it four times, A New Way to Be Human. And I want you to understand, this is, the fra this is an important phrase, new way to be human. Why? Because if there's a new way to be human, then there's a new way to think as a new way to be a human. You can't have old thinking with a new human. It doesn't work. They are not good bedfellows. There is a new way of thinking that comes with being a new, a new human a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that's not, and understand, it, yes, God does want to heal mind. He wants to heal your mind. He doesn't just heal you spiritually and reconnect you to the Father. He makes a whole new you. Wow. See, we need anointing not just so we can have a special phrase spoken over us. We need anointing just to go to Walmart. We need anointing to drive in the morning traffic. We need anointing to go anywhere and do any. We need anointing to read the news. I'm going to say it. We need anointing to read the news. We need a renewed mind. Just to read the news, just to see what's going on in the world, just to watch YouTube. You need a renewed mind. You need a mind that lines up with the Word of God. Well, I got one amen out of it. That's good. 
See, we need anointing just to make it as believers against the war of our own minds. But here's the, here's the pinnacle. Because the third thing he says is, is my cup overflows. Not only when I come into the tent of the Father does, there, does he have that place card set right next to him for me. A seat of honor, a place next to him where he has prepared the table and invited my enemies to see the blessing that he has planned for me. He, he doesn't just do that. When I walk into his tent, he doesn't just say, oh, here, let me remove your past and anoint you. Let me help you with the thoughts in your set from, from where you world in the, were in the world and separated to a son or a daughter of the Most High. Let me help you change your mind and the way that you think about yourself and about your situation and what the Word says. Let me do that, but the place where He hands you a cup that overflows. Wow. My cup overflows. See, a cup here is not just a cup. It's not just a cup. He's not talking about coming over and saying, oh, uh, this isn't Herschel's where you get a refill of coffee right to the lip. And sometimes they pour over it. That's not what he's talking about. It's not, a, it's not just about that. Because see, a cup was a, a typology. It was a symbol of your portion. So if I could say this a little better for you, he doesn't just say that my cup, uh, uh, this, this utensil that I use to drink overflows. No, he says my portion is more than enough. He says my portion is more than enough. An allotment, a portion was an allotment given to you by God in the Old Testament. It was tribal lands and borders as God broke up the land to tribal regions. And later it was about legacy that was passed on from one generation to the next. And now it all is all of the above. What we have received through Jesus Christ is not just enough, it's more than enough. My cup runs over, my portion overflows. That means if my portion is over, then what is poured out upon me, what I have within me that is in an overflowing capacity, is not for me to grab and do this with. Let it drop off the table. Let it go where it needs to go because somebody out there needs a little bit of what you've got. And if you're willing to let your portion overflow, then somebody out there can be touched without ever you saying a word to them. Come on, that's good. Because the more Jesus becomes who he's supposed to be in our lives, the more people stop seeing you, they see him. And it's him that they want. Hallelujah. My portion is my portion overflows. God, you're not just enough. You don't, listen, I have never known God to give subsistence. He never says, I give you just enough. He says, I give you more than enough. I give you enough to spread around. Don't believe me? Jesus manifests that with five loaves and two fish. He fed 5,000 with a sandwich. And there was still enough for 12 baskets. These were not small baskets. These were baskets. Think in terms of bigger than laundry baskets. These were baskets. More than enough. He does it again with 4,000. Oh, it's so crazy. He, uh, not only that, but think about this one. Uh, there, there's this story, and I know I'm just kind of fishing <laughs> for a second. Notice that was segue into the next story. But there's this moment where they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, do you believe in paying taxes? And he goes, well, do you got a, co a coin with you? And they said, yeah, whose face is on the coin? Caesar's. We'll give to Caesar what Caesar's then. Oh, pastor, he didn't say that he believed in paying taxes. Really? Check the next step. Uh, to all of my fishing buddies, one of you, go out, cast your net. He didn't say go to a specific spot. He said, cast your net. You're going to find a fish. One, you might cast your net and find this one fish. Just know it. If you, you'll know this, cut it open. And when he cuts it open, inside is a gold coin. And he says, not just this. He says, now go pay mine and yours. 
See, he doesn't just do enough. He's more than enough. He does enough to go around to spread around. Your cup overflows. Your portion overflows. It's overwhelming the abundance of God in your life. If, if we can remind ourselves, and it's not just monetary, it's not just all of that. It, it's more, it's, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is my portion. And my portion overflows. Wow. This returns us to David's first statement about lordship that the reason David can say he lacks no thing is because God has made it possible for all things to be abundantly provided in relationship to and with him. That's why our, our favorite scripture, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything that we can ask or think according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Come on, think about it. He doesn't just do enough. He doesn't give you enough to survive. He gives you more enough to share. And so church, uh, understand this is, this is a powerful thought, a kingdom thought, uh, uh, an expansion thought. And if you look through the lens, I'm closing here. If you look through this lens and understand what he's talking about, then, then I'm going to share with you the, the, the conclusion of, of this when it says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When he says he's anointed my head with oil. When he says my portion overflows. Look no further than not your physical possessions and provisions of God. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. What do I mean by that? If you look at the table that is set before him, if you break that down, think about it in terms of communion. Here's Jesus and he sets a table before his 12 disciples. And when he sets the table for them, what does he say? Oh, the meal was good because the meal is me. You want a meal that's going to help you overcome what people think about you, the meal is me. You, you, want a, you want a part of this new kingdom that's coming, the meal is me. Partake of my, the, the bread is my body broken. The blood is, is the, my blood shed for you. Take these in remembrance of me. As often as you come together, get, get together, get together, get together, get together, get together. And as often as you get together, have communion, have this. Not Last Supper, ladies and gentlemen. We call it the Last Supper. And that's, that's only because on Jesus' earthly ministry, it was his Last Supper. But that moment that those disciples took the meal that was presented before them, the accuser of the brethren got shut down. No, you didn't hear that. The moment they took the bread... And the cup. And they ate and they partook of who Jesus is. He said, this is my body. Take it. It's broken for you. Shed for the remission of sins. This is what it is. And the moment they took that, their sonship, their, their, they were solidified at the table of honor. And the enemy, in the presence of his, their enemy, he was told to sit down. You can't accuse the son anymore. And when you come to anointing, think about what the, the anointing, it's not just the word of God. It is the blood and the spirit. Okay, it's the blood that washes us and cleanses us of sin. It takes care of our past. And it is the washing of the water of the word that comes in, that, that, brings, that brings an additional bit of change in us. But it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives that helps us to renew what's going on. It's the fullness of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, I'm going to send the promise of the Father. I'm not just going... And think of the promise of the Father. In the Old Testament, yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, I'm going to take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. I'm not going to just give you tw uh, the two tablets of stone with ten commandments on it. I'm going to put my word in your heart. He gave the more than enough portion and he poured the anointing of the calling of Jesus, the blood of Jesus upon his head and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring that cleansing and to bring that life. And then he brings you in to sonship. Your portion overflows because you're a son. Your portion overflows because you're a daughter. You belong. Because the Father says whatever is mine yours.
you don't have to sit around thinking you don't have enough to measure up in this world, to measure up in the church. You might think to yourself, oh man, my relationship with God is lacking. It's just not where it needs to be. Listen, it's not because there isn't enough. It's because you've forgotten that there's more than enough. He has supplied you with everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. You have the more than enough in Jesus through relationship. You have the more than enough in Jesus through his blood and the promise of the Father. You have the more than enough through Jesus in the presence of your enemies. It all comes back to Jesus. It always has and it always will. So when you walk out the door, don't walk out defeated because you have a seat at the table of the king. And when you are struggling with thoughts in your mind, remind yourself, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. He anoints my head with oil. He has removed my past. There is no more remnant of my past. It's gone. He has removed those seeds of negativity that have buried themselves in my mind that are seeking to destroy me and war against the members of my mind trying to seek to bring destruction to my life. He's already anointed me and that is a repellent for those things. He's given me the fullness of sonship so that I don't walk around as a second class citizen in the kingdom. I walk as a son. You know, there's a difference between carrying yourself as a second-class citizen and carrying yourself as a son. I grew up with a lot of brats. Close with this story. I grew up with a lot of brats. A lot of brats whose way of defending themselves was not, do you know who I am? It was, do you know who my daddy is? Especially in the church. My daddy's on the board. You have no business correcting me. This is the church I grew up in. Now that's different because I know Jack has put belt to tail of my own kids uh, here at the church. So I... I no, your community property when you get to the church, but no, I'm kidding. But you, you know what I'm you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it takes a village, yes, it does. Praise the Lord. So, uh, but we uh, but but they would always throw around. My, my daddy is this. My daddy is this. You know who my daddy is. My daddy does this for the church, and he does this for the church. And it's almost like if you get on if you get on to me for my bad behavior, my my daddy is gonna just make it all go away. Right mentality for the kingdom, wrong attitude. Because the fact of the matter is, is you call, you carry yourself as a son. Your daddy's bigger than anybody else's daddy. There's no question. Your daddy's more powerful than anyone else's daddy. There is no question. Your daddy's provision by far exceeds anyone else's provision they could ever make for you. You don't belong to anyone other than your daddy in heaven when it comes to this. And so if you carry yourself as the son and daughter, it's not so you walk around and go, you better treat me right because I'm a Christian. It's you don't have to worry about how people treat you because you are a Christian. It's nice to be respected because you're a Christian, but in this world of darkness, just get ready to know that it's not going to happen. But it's a good thing that we aren't held by someone else's opinion. I'm held by my father's. He calls me son. Anytime he talks to me, he calls me son. He doesn't even call me by my name. He calls me son. That lets me know he knows that he means business. I'm a son. You're a son and a daughter, ladies and gentlemen. Carry yourself that way. Because everything that he has given you spells out in Psalm 23, verse 5. He's for you. 